Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall. If my voice sounds a little bit off this week, um, I have got a slight sore throat and uh, I've got that deep, dark, sexy voice going on, so um, you can enjoy that. Um, And I'm joined here by the one and only Ben Escrow from DeNovo Nutrition, and I'm very happy to have him here. If you haven't heard of Ben, um, then I will briefly introduce him and then let him talk about himself for a bit, but he has a a huge educational background background. So he is an MS in pharmaceutical chemistry and sports nutrition and in exercise science, a BS in nutrition and dietetics. He is also a registered dietitian, a certified strength and conditioning specialist, and has six plus years working with individuals ranging from gem pop to world champions, which speaks for itself. Um, He also has a really cool competitive background. So he's actually a USBF pro qualified natural bodybuilder. Um, and also a USPL powerlifter and has done so done pretty damn well at both um, which is really cool and I mean our audience are basically all bodybuilders and powerlifters or physique athletes of some kind so uh, uh, having someone who's very knowledgeable and actively competitive in those areas is um, not new to them but always exciting and tells them that it's someone they should listen to Um, he's also are you now joint uh, co-owners kind of with DeNovo with Luke or um, are you still kind of top dog on that Yes, we are co-owners. Cool. So, I mean, the guys might have heard of DeNovo Nutrition, uh, which is super exciting. Um, You might have seen that I've now become kind of an athlete of theirs, which is really cool. I'm really honored to have that. Um, And yeah, it's going to be exciting when they come over to the UK, which we were just kind of talking about. But uh, is there anything else you kind of want to say to the listeners, Luke or uh, Luke, (laughs) Ben? Um, I... I mean, not at this point. I, I'm I'm not great at talking about myself. I'm better at talking about ideas that I feel like I can I can separate from from Ben. Um, I think you you did a good job <laughs> at summarizing things. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. I'm dumbfounded when people ask me to talk about myself. I'm like, I'm really boring. <laughs> and then they ask me questions. I'm like, Oh, I actually have things to say. Uh, yeah. So, as we spoke on even off air, um, one of the things I wanted to kind of touch on was. Back in the day, you kind of had the De Novo Element series and you had the really cool round uh, tables with experts and you touched on different areas. And I know in the intro intro video, um, you kind of talked about the problem with fitness right now, and this was recorded years ago, mind you, is that there's just information overload almost and that people are kind of a bit lost. They're almost like finding very detailed information and minutiae, you might say, um, without any foundation to duck to go from um, and I thought that was fantastic because even though this was recorded years ago um, I still see that problem today um, and I just love to hear from you kind of what you think the the kind of foundations are for people what should they be focusing on in terms of kind of when they are trying to improve within the gym if they're a powerlifter or bodybuilder what for you are the foundations that people just just understand that many of them might not so I think the interesting part about, um, and this kind of expands even beyond fitness, uh, just into general in, in the way that we're moving, uh, I guess, worldwide with tech, technology and access to information is, uh, I think it creates these pseudo experts or, or since you can Google anything um, and almost have the sensation that that gives you the knowledge uh, it, it almost sets up this sense of false belief of, of knowledge because you can say, oh, I want to know this. Let me Google it. And because something explains it in a way that kind of makes sense to you at whatever level of knowledge you are, then it, it gives you this confidence that, oh, I, I know the answer now. When the reality is if you can't filter the information appropriately, then you could be actually going backwards or just making a total lateral move. Um, so I think I think that applies to fitness as well is now there's so many people because people have realized that there there's a market that demands knowing and that now wants better answers or wants information and there there's nothing to there's no real gateway mm-hmm. to to prevent uh, people from providing information it's like I guess the best analogy I could use is, is practicing medicine. Like you don't have a lot of people uh, providing 
advice on the best way to do brain surgery with without an MD or, or a website. You don't have people talking about cancer intervention that much without some type of elaborate medical background. But but we do have this in fitness. And I think I think the, the fundamental root of the problem is that everybody wants to make a buck and be their own boss and blah blah blah, but a lot of people try to skip the process in, in building the background and the fundamentals to actually do it and totally understand holistically like what they're even talking about or recommending. So I think it comes back to, to first principles. And the best way you learn first principles is by learning the fundamentals of physiology, which, which happens really in <laughs> – it's hard to work around is either getting an undergraduate um, – in some field of physiology, which is like nutrition, ex science, uh, something with medicine, um, or educating yourself. And, and I think, but I think the difficulty is, and I found this myself in, in my own journey of, uh, I guess, both academic education and then self ex exploration education, is the reason I like the academic path much more is they have the system set up of where it goes from level one to level two to level three. Um, whereas on the internet, or if you're just trying to educate yourself with books, it's all at once and you need to determine what's, what's basement level, what's, you know, floor one, floor two, floor three. So I think to, to try to really answer that question, uh, I think the, the only real ability to, fully determine first principles and, and have ownership of that knowledge is to commit the time to, to really, um, and, and I want to be careful in saying that I don't think it has to be through a school system, but you need to have some type of peer review or, or some way to have a, a guide or a mentor or someone who knows more than you in the process to let you know, like, no, that's way off so they can redirect you. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I feel like I could, I could maybe soapbox for a while on that, but I, I want you to redirect me in case I haven't really answered the question. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I don't know if I had a particular answer I was looking for or had a particular way that I wanted you to, to attack it, but I think you attacked in a really refreshing way in that, uh, a way that I think a lot of the listeners will be able to kind of com understand in that something that came to me was just like, I mean, you look on social media, you see any Joe blog can have an, kind of their own blog. They can have their own Instagram account. They can be sharing kind of all these different infographics. They can be referencing studies. They could not be referencing studies. They could be cherry picking yep. studies. And it just becomes incredibly difficult as someone who is maybe a lay person who doesn't have any foundational education to then pick apart what's right and what's wrong. And they kind of, they don't know who to trust. Um, and I think for myself, having not come from a background like yourself, like I haven't got an MS in kind of these various things, I think I've slowed down my ability to get as far as I have. Like, I think I'd be much further if I had that background and I would have loved to um, realize I had the passion for it. And it's just taken so much time to really reread, read textbooks, try and understand from experts, get mentoring, go to seminars and get that foundational idea. Um, and I think it is, I think there has to be some sort of responsibility with people when we are talking about nutrition and training, like, they are as like big aspects to the human body. You can do some real damage if you give someone bad nutrition and training advice. I think if I think if you want to do this, you need to have some sense of responsibility, and and that's what you said. And to me, I look at I look at licensing and credentials as that. Is you can lose like I can lose my RD if I do something that um, that hurts somebody or someone reports me or, or something like that. Like that 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 puts more skin in the game. It's just like a, an MD who, who can get sued for malpractice and lose their license. Like, and the reality is it doesn't make things perfect, but it makes it, it better. Mm -hmm. uh, like how many people would go to a surgeon who has no MD? Nobody. But people will constantly or gladly go get nutrition advice from somebody who just kind of looks the part and oftentimes has just learned from somebody else um, and is just you know, regurgitating what, what they learn. And I'm, not, I'm not discrediting experience. I just think it, it's two sides of the same coin. So I think I think you need, just like you said, you need to have that that part inside you that self-regulates and says, okay, I have a lot of experience, but I need to complement that. 
because the person who's just book smart isn't great always with a real world intervention yeah. and the person who's just experienced it's almost like they'll they'll take in everything and just keep kind of shooting at the wall but never really know which thing did it they'll throw mm -hmm. you know 20 different things at at a problem and they'll never be able to tease down what the one thing was that 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 caused that change um mm -hmm. So I think, again, that, that causes a lot of confusion and it propagates a lot of confusion. Um, so I, I look at it, and I'm going to use a, a chemistry analogy here uh, just because I feel like it's most appropriate, is I, I look at more time in like questioning the questions and, and questioning your knowledge and, and all of those things. It's, it's almost like setting up a more elaborate filter. So let's say we have, let's say we have this filter that lets... I don't know, all big things like, uh, let's say a coffee filter. I'm just, I guess, trying to make it more real world applicable. Mm -hmm. And this coffee filter has big holes where it lets small grains of the coffee bean come through. Uh, and then we could get a more elaborate filter, which only lets the liquid pass through. I, I think that's analogous to spending more time in, in education is it allows you to refine your filter. So you can constantly tease out Okay, and it goes back to the other thing I said about first principles is like the more you question and the more you learn and realize how much you don't know, the more elaborate you can set up those filters and the less noise every time in, in the process. And I think, I think that is the bottom line is actually getting answers, especially with the chaos is, again, like I said, you're filtering. You're just filtering information. Um, and I think... I, 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 I want to be careful to walk the line of, of like, I don't want to discredit expertise of people who are just purely experience based. Like, and I realize sometimes it can sound like condescending. It's like, Oh, if you're not educated, you shouldn't be talking. That's, that's not true. I, I just think you can't discredit education either. Um, cause I, I think it does make a big difference. And the reality is most of the people that you see as authority figures have, have those, those backgrounds. And it's where a lot of people are getting the information from and then regurgitating it to a, a broader audience. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, uh, one last point, just the last point to make on that is, um, and, and you, you touched on this too, is, is I think true learning is, is an elliptical pattern. You, you, uh, it's not linear. Like people want to say, okay, here's the, the basement level. Um, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three. I think to actually get the better answers and, and then provide them to a, a broader audience is you have to go basement, step one, step two, back to step one, potentially back to basement, then back up to step one, step two. It's like you're constantly, uh, like I said, the the pattern over time is linear, but you, you are, you're kind of circling back. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I understand that that can be, it, it is, it's grueling and it, it can be exhausting, but man, um, it's, it's worth it and it's gratifying. No, I, I, I agree with so many things you said there. And I think something I want to make sure, I think the listeners, you kind of clarified it, that you're not like education is like the be all and end all, but, um, it's like some people discredit it completely because uh, there's very educated people out there who are maybe saying not so many smart things, nutrition, training related, um, but yep. like it goes both ways. So I think something I've always found important is kind of looking at people and part of my filter is kind of who are they associated with? Are those smart people? Do they get results themselves and with their clients? That's kind of a good indication that they kind of know what they're doing um, and all of those sort of aspects. And then education is also obviously really, really helpful as well. And I think we kind of talked about responsibility on behalf of like the person putting out the information. I also think people themselves need to take more responsibility in the information they're absorbing because some people are just very ignorant and they don't they just think it's not ever their fault but anything yeah. you're digesting like anything you put in your mouth any any supplement you take you should know what that's going to do to you and you can't blame the, like my protein or wherever you're buying this supplement from you need to do some research yourself and take some responsibility on, on your behalf of yourself i think uh I think the part for, for me is that since nobody ever just starts with, no one starts at the end with like, 
oh, okay, day one, I'm going to get into fitness. Day two, I have a PhD. Like, so I, I think that I identify very much with that struggle for, for information and for, for filtering to find the best thing. And I always identify with that person when I was 18 years old and first got into it who, who wanted the better answers, who didn't want to be constantly like banging my head against the wall and going in this weird, erratic, nonlinear path to, to finding out, you know, the best way to write a good intervention or get the better supplements and all of those things. But I think, I think one of the things I've learned in now a, a decade of it is those parts are all pivotal to the process. Like you have to make the mistakes, but it very much depends on what you do when you make the mistake. Mm -hmm. If you say, um, if you, if you make that flub up and, and you're, I don't know, embarrassed or something goes wrong, I think you need to respond to that, that drive or shame or whatever it is and say, okay, this is impetus to learn more, to seek out better answers and refine. So it's never like you failed. It's just, you got an, next level of refinement. And I think, I think the real challenge when I look back now and say, okay, how, how do, how, what's the best way that I could present the information that I've learned to somebody that, that could reach the broadest spectrum. And I, I, I come back to this, this same dilemma every time, which is when you are just starting to get in at, at the, the bottom level, you want black and white answers. Yeah. And as you spend more time in it and the horizon broadens, a lot more gray comes into the picture, mm -hmm. a lot more. So when people come to you and they want black and white answer, but your brain realizes all the gray, it's like, how do I answer this person with, without totally shutting their curiosity off or um, confusing them to the point where that they're even more lost? And, and I, that's why I like written. Uh, better because okay. I feel like I can communicate that in a more linear fashion like here's step one here's step two here's step um, and I know people who are a lot better orators than me who can do it through spoken word uh, but I, I do I, like I, I totally understand and identify the challenge is, is when when you're just starting out you want something to be good versus bad yeah and it, it's so contextual um, so I, I apologize if I've tangented a little bit too much there, but that's stuff that I all wanted to get out. No, I think it's, it's really interesting and I, I completely agree. Like it, we it frustrates me no end when people want black and white answers and the horrible answer that you end up trying to, like you don't want to give people is it depends or we need context and often you don't have the time then to take the whole entire context. But, um, when you can, that's when you can give an actual useful answer because it, it always depends um, it's never a kind of this, it's always this way. It's always that way. There's always tiny little details that maybe need considering before giving someone an answer. And I think it, the trouble comes in actually, I think Eric Helms, my post about it recently is, and we kind of have spoken about it when people get a level of knowledge where they have kind hmm. of a, quite a good understanding and they feel like they know everything and then they give answers to everyone and it's almost black and white. And then it's once you get past that and you kind of, this is kind of the steps forward and then steps back, I guess. You feel so, like you know nothing. you've touched on another another one of the issues, which is once you get social reinforcement, because I, I think I think there's a there's a very big difference between uh, an ob objective level of knowledge where you are challenged by your peers who know the the same or more information than you, and they can actually they can check you much more appropriately. It's almost like an NBA player playing versus high school players yeah. when it's the so when it's the social checking versus like NBA players versus other NBA players when you know like you're you're in I don't know a graduate like program or something so but anyway the point is I think I found this a lot and I don't think I think it's important to be cognizant of the flaws but uh, and try to do something about them but I think I think they're it's it's a multifaceted problem meaning um, now with with things like Instagram and social media platforms, you can gain, and this existed before where it was just the biggest guy giving all the advice in the, uh, in the gym where people said they made this, this, uh, this correlation of like biggest guy must know all the answers. Uh, and, and I think that still happens a lot online is like biggest arms must know the answers. Uh, you know, leanest dude must know all the answers. Yeah. And I think it's great that we have certain people who, who actually have both, like Berto's a good person. Yeah. Um, but I think the danger in that is if you 
you have the ability on social media to only cultivate the audience you want. And if, if they're always saying great job, that's, that's, uh, you know, great education or great, uh, information, but they don't have the basis to check you. You keep putting out stuff thinking that you're, 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 uh, you're always in the right. And it starts to develop this really strong bias where you can't be challenged by anybody. And because you have a bigger following, you think by default, you're right. It's almost yeah. like the difference between a debate versus like a peer review, mm -hmm. um, where in a debate, <laughs> it's like politics. The person who's usually more favored by the people will win the debate. That doesn't always mean the best information is coming out. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love being an observer from the outside and watching and thinking, okay, like how, how can we still put out the information without it being in a way that, and, and that, that might be the impossible question is how does it not become about popularity and become about the value of the idea? Um, but I think there's this happy medium where it's like needs to be popular enough, but you still need to check yourself with the information you put out. Yeah. All right, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think it's really interesting because I think it's very much like personal bias. There's definitely people in the fitness. In it's like um, anyone who's worth their, their kind of who's I, I don't know what the, the quote is right now, but worth their their salt. Is it worth their salt? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Alan Aragon, for example, he'll always say like, don't just listen to what I'm saying. And as if I'm like a dictator, I want you to think about it critically. And anyone who anyone else like that will be the same. They don't want just to add it dictatorship. They don't want to be dogmatic. Um, but there are people that you will just like their personality type, whatever it might be, just is similar to yours. And so you just want to go near them and like listen to what they're saying. So I think that is really difficult to sometimes kind of divulge and make sure that kind of you're getting the right answers rather than just the answers you're looking for. Um, yep. And I think there's people who are very good at that. So um, they're the people like Eric Helms who are always updating what they're saying and if they get something wrong, they'll be very, very true and honest about it. Or um, it's just difficult from the outside in always to know whether someone is like that and that is their character. So um, it's just, yeah, it's a difficult one. Um, but I definitely see it, exactly what you're saying. Something I did want to ask you, um, and it's in some ways related, I guess. Um, it was kind of, what are some of the most important lessons you've learned through training and coaching individuals? And then as a part two, which I can remind you of if you forget it, um, how do you apply those lessons to other aspects of your life? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I think the first one, uh, I'm somebody who always needs to test. I think I always need to test the limits and I also, I always need to test it in practical scenarios. Like I, I'm, yeah, like you said, it feeds off the, what we were just talking about is, I can hear somebody say something or I can read something in a book, but I have to do it. Like I, I don't feel like I actually have owned that knowledge until I've, I've done it and I've observed it myself mm -hmm. because otherwise, like you said, you're just obeying what you've been told. Um, so I think if I was to make a very general response to that, to that, that would be it is like, um, I think for me, <laughs> the filters are open and not filtering anything initially. And then I start to test it and start to filter and refine the filters more and more to figure out what's really driving stuff. And I think, I think that happened a lot with the combination of, okay, I'm going to learn this in, in class and then I can go do it either in the gym or I can, you know, do it. Uh, and it doesn't always need to be this, this super refined way. Like for example, uh, when I first started formulating, like I didn't have this super expensive machinery. I didn't have like, I just used blenders, like food blenders. Mm -hmm. Um, and like you can source stuff like, like flavoring ingredients, like sweeteners and acidulants, like from eBay and stuff. So, um, I was able to, to buy a book and then test stuff out immediately where it says, okay, here's the application level that you should use in this product. Okay. Well, well, what does that mean for, the difference between a protein and a pre-workout and a blah, blah, blah. Cause books don't tell you that. Like you find that through, through doing it. Um, so I, I always think I'm always looking for ways I can pull from this broad thing and apply it to a universal 
uh, array of specific answers. Um, so uh, that's, that even happens with clients is, is I'm always looking when I'm working with somebody, I look at it and say, okay, this is how this person responded, but where's the, where's the universal truth where that applies to almost all humans? It's like mm -hmm. a difference between deductive reasoning and associative reasoning. Um, and I'm always trying to go down that deductive funnel. Uh, so I guess in a way that might have answered both aspects of the question. Mm -hmm. Um, and if not, please, please let me know. But, but I think, I think the bottom line is, um, I'm, I'm less interested in, in hyper specificity in a field and like basically learning nutrition and, and only how that applies to nutrition. I'm way more interested in connecting the dots of like, okay, nutrition is physiology, uh, and, and chemistry. So like, where can I connect this dot between both of them that applies also to exercise science? Mm -hmm. And, and usually that just means, you know, diving, diving deeper and, um, and testing it. And like I said, it, it's great to have myself as an ongoing human test subject and then people I work with. Because uh, nothing's ever done. It's just you're getting closer to, mm -hmm. to some end point. Yeah. No, I, I really like that. It's kind of an analogy it reminds me of is kind of that you read um, a recipe in a book, but you kind of follow the instructions you make yourself. And sometimes it doesn't always turn out like the picture in, on, in the, the, the kind of recipe book. And maybe you don't like the taste of it, so then you have to trial and error things. It's just like training programs or anything like that. Like it's it's foundational knowledge, and then you have to then see what sticks and applies. And um, I think a lot of good coaches kind of trial things on themselves a little bit beforehand so that it makes sense. So um, no, I completely see that in so many areas of life. Kind of like you don't know it until you've actually experienced it yourself. Everyone can tell you chocolate's delicious, but if you haven't actually tried chocolate, you don't really know exactly what that means. And then there are some right. strange people that hate it. So, <laughs> uh, no, I really like that answer. Um, and then on a similar note, what's the one training or nutritional implementation or change you found very effective in the last year? Um, so, yeah, something you've changed or used nutritionally or um, training-wise that kind of has been interesting this last year or has seen some good efficacious results this this is actually going to sound probably contradictory to older versions of myself because i think i think very much like science is a religion to me it's like everybody is is a uh, uh devout to some religion whether they think they are or not even an atheist is devout to atheism um and i think before I believe that it was the problem was almost completely objective. Like, uh, and I've always tried to test that with elements of subjectivity. So, for, for the nutrition aspect, I think before a while ago, before like things have blossomed with more options, and I think Berto's partly responsible for that too, where people thought like certain foods were illegal, like pop tarts and stuff, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and like he he allowed globally like bodybuilders to relax a little bit with with dieting in prep um and live a little bit too uh i think i always had the question of okay well we know on a on a substrate level that the bottom line for getting body comp goals is usually it, the, the first level is usually an energy balance question and then from there it's, it's like moving up the pyramid the base of the pyramid is, is energy balance um, so I think a thing for me was always, okay, well, why can't I let the, the subject drive their subjective cravings for the nutrition intervention rather than giving someone a 40, 30, 30 split or, uh, these certain values that are just, I think propagated by people as the accepted ranges. Why can't I let their preference drive a little bit how I'm going to implement the nutrition strategy? So I think I, I did that and, and I, it gave me. A lot of answers of number one is adherence because uh, ultimately that's what you're always yeah. battling is, is attrition of uh, it's nutrition attrition yeah. uh, and I think that uh, that's a big part of it is you have to let people drive I almost feel like they're driving the 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 car mm -hmm. and and you're like a co-pilot in it I think that's the best way that you create long-term change and, and behavioral change. So I think I first realized that with nutrition and then I started to apply it a little bit more to programming. Um, 
Now, don't get me wrong. There are certain principles you have to adhere to. Yeah. But, for example, when someone came to me for uh, – originally, I, I was more focused on the bodybuilding crowd and I did a lot more prep. And then as I got more into powerlifting, I kind of became – I guess got more notoriety with powerlifters. So I started doing a lot more powerlifting interventions. But uh, I think I, I took that that principle – I learned and I said, okay, like we have to do this amount of strength work. Well, why can't I let them dictate their own hypertrophy work cool. where basically I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you a global volume that you need to hit, but you could hit it any way you want with your hypertrophy work. So it, it, I think it eliminates this, this level of like things getting mundane and boring is like, I have to do bicep curls and lat pull downs for eight sets or like eight sets of six or, or whatever, like something like that where as long as you hit the volume, you could choose the sets and reps you want to do. And so I think I, that's a very interesting area for me where um, on paper you can write the best possible inter intervention, but if no one can follow it, you're ineffective. Yeah. Um, but again, like, and this is where the analysis and questions never end for me, is uh, <clears throat> I think some people don't like that level of freedom. Yeah. Also, so you run into that challenge is, is like people want this set mm -hmm. program and they just want, like I said, black and white. Uh, so it's a constant challenge. But I think the answer to your question is um, finding this level of being able to be liberal within a within a system that still meets these checks and balances. Mm -hmm. No, I really like that. I think giving someone autonomy is like such a game changer i know uh, i remember when when i was working years ago now like in an office job um and my manager was like trying to give me autonomy and giving me tasks to do and whenever he made me feel like i was the one who like instigated something or did it myself it was like yeah i'm gonna get that job done i'm way more like up for it um i think i think you'll probably find this yourself whenever i'm with clients i think when i first bring them on it's kind of a difficulty to do that i kind of have to make sure that they kind of know what they're doing but once they've got a background of Kind of education and knowledge they understand things and they can make appropriate choices because i guess just like with nutrition if you gave them like okay hit this protein target and hit your calories then you'd be like oh no they're just gonna eat, drink whey protein shakes and kind of eat pop tarts or something along those lines you'd be like no that's not how it should be um or the same with training like okay get this amount of back volume um however sets and reps and whatever and they might do some very odd kind of weird single arm right cable lap pulled that would be fine but i'm trying to think of a weird exercise um so no i, I completely agree and I, that's really refreshing i think a lot of people discount that there can be a lot of autonomy like coaching isn't just about dictatorship like we've talked about before like giving people the ability to learn themselves and learn their own bodies and kind of get that individualization via autonomy almost um i always say it to my clients and i'm sure you're the same kind of they know their body is probably way better than we could ever. We can't feel what they're feeling. So I think it's important to give them the opportunity at least to have some control. Yeah, I think uh, it's funny because when you look at, I think you can make this this comparison with, with social issues too, is when someone feels oppressed, ultimately they will rebel over time. So it's like you're trying to find this, this tipping point of uh, not necessarily where where someone doesn't it's where someone doesn't feel oppressed but they're still getting it, it it's not it's not a dictatorship like they they feel free but they're 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 functioning within a system that, of yeah. set of set rules um and and i think that's ultimately where you have to get for a long term sustainable approach where it's going to work not just for the contest prep, not just for the meat prep, but, you know, drawn out long, long term. Because uh, like I said, eventually at some point, everybody or most people get frustrated over time with feeling like they're just following someone else's, you know, guideline for 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 their life. Um, so like I said, it's not necessarily that you're not oppressed. You just can't feel oppressed. <laughs> no, I think I completely I mean, something that comes right to mind is like flexible dieting. You have the macros there and then you can be flexible within those but there are some like overriding rules to make sure you're getting it there and like you said the, the volume kind of with the training you have to get in this much on each muscle group whatever it might be um, and I think 
when you have a really good understanding of things, there is so, this is why then the art of programming, the art of nutritional intervention can come in because there's so many different ways you could do things. And there's not necessarily one best way. The best way is probably like they always say, like the diet you can stick to, the training plan you can stick to and consistently make progressions with. So um, no, I think that's really, really interesting to hear. And um, I don't know if you've got anything more to say on that, but I do have another kind of question I wanted to go down. I think real quick, the only thing I'd say is I think you use the perfect word for that, which is that's when it becomes an art. And, and I do think at a point, it does become almost like an artistic expression, uh, writing a program or making a formula yeah. or making nutrition intervention. Perfect. Um, so yeah, the, the next thing I wanted to touch on was, again, drawing upon some of your old content was uh, mental muscle. And this was number three in which you talked about investing intrinsically. And I don't think this is talked about enough, which is why I wanted to talk about it here. And um, kind of basically it's about being you versus you rather than you versus them. Um, and focusing on being better and I just wanted to kind of get you to touch on it talk about it it was for me when I I think I listened to it back when you first released it I re-listened to it and I was just like it's just very inspirational really nice to hear those words and I think it's just always good to hear someone talk about these things in a really passionate way uh yeah I, I think I think that really is just a personal philosophy that it actually makes me happy to know that it's it's resonated and I think the way I look at it is I'm not someone, I don't enjoy uh, conflict and fighting. I don't because I think there's always, I think you can find a way where, where you can't make everybody happy, but you can always work on, on improving things. And to me, if you're always looking for someone extrinsically to fight, you can always find an enemy and you, you'll always get into a fight, but it's almost like you're fixated on, on winning, not necessarily improving yeah. and I think there's a very fundamental difference so I think for me I, I'd rather fight me because in the end I will always become better because of it and I'm not causing someone else I guess strife because of it it's like I'm always trying to beat the old version of myself yeah. and that can yes can be exhausting but um, I, I'd much rather do that because I I don't want to subject, <laughs> I don't know, somebody else to that, to that struggle. It's like, unless it's going to do something and, and we're both engaged in the fight that we want to be, but I, I'm, I'm more interested in win-wins than I am like win-lose. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately life can't always be that way. But, um, I think aspiring to it at least gets you closer to the side of win-win than, than win-lose. Um, so yeah, I, I think, Again, I think I think it comes down to a fundamental level of what do you really want out of out of your time here? And for me, it's answers. Like I just I want to get as close to truth as I can, and um, and I think the best way to do that is just constantly be assessing, reevaluating, questioning. And I can't like you can't get caught up in the drama or the noise or all the other stuff because that's going to derail you from that path every single time. Um, so it, it, I, I guess in a way it could sound self-absorbed, but, but I'd say more so I'm just hyper fixated on, on what I, I want to get back out of life. And, and I just don't even, I, I don't even really regard stuff that's just not even going to contribute to that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I guess that's really the best way I would describe it in, in more words, uh, is I, I don't know. I, I'd like to think even going back on the programming stuff is with the experimentation of everything is I've, I've done very extreme things to get answers. And, and in many ways it, it has ended at least my competitive, uh, lifting career. But I think to me, the silver lining of all of that is I've, I've learned so much in doing that, that now I know the line for other people to not, yeah. to not, uh, you know, cross. And I could also look at it and I could be angry and be like, well, everybody else can do it and I can't. But, like I said, to me, it's like, okay, well, what can I do in this scenario rather than just, you know, <laughs> I, I guess, uh, just, just be angry all the time. Like what positive can I do with this? Mm -hmm. So, um, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> no, I, 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 it speaks to me massively. I think a lot of your, your personality traits may be similar to mine in that 
kind of I'm if anyone knows me uh, I'm very much not never looking for controversy I don't like it I don't like it when people are in arguments um, I'm not a very good debater because I always try and find like a middle ground where we both agree <laughs> with each other and um, none of these things seem to work and um, I just think it's very refreshing because you see so many people kind of like people love conflict and they try and make out as if they've got the right way or the wrong way and it's I think the overall vision and passion for just it's it's kind of like to me it sounds like world peace almost like trying to find the right answer is like trying to get actual just world peace like so many people think they want that but they do not act in a way that they're trying to actually achieve that so i i think i've come to a place where i understand that the most popular thing that that's never going to be the most popular concept or idea but i think it, it will speak to enough people that over time it can influence us to try to at least aspire to move in that direction because Again, I, I guess in a roundabout way, touching on things that we've already addressed is I understand the entertainment of a fight, but a lot of times there's not much to be learned other than this person won, this person lost. Um, and I, I think <laughs> I think fights are acutely entertaining. Mm-hmm. I, I think, but I think there's so much more to extract from not having it go to that that place if if that makes sense um so again and i think it feeds back into like the truth and and the learning part of it is like i don't know whose quote it was i forget like you learn a lot from being punched in the face or whatever (laughs) i I don't i don't discredit that but i don't think that that's like universally applicable to all scenarios like let's fight about everything because (laughs) the answers are going to come out no, I think I, I, well, it does kind of ring true to when you make mistakes, you just learn so much more. So if you do get into someone does kind of challenge you on something and they prove you wrong, then hopefully you can learn from that. And you, I mean, if anyone ever does do that to you, I think that's if you're the right type of person, you'll make sure that you're not wrong again and kind of it'll kind of make you want that's, to be better. So you, you touched on that perfectly. I think there's the defensive pride instinct of this person questioned me, they might be right, they're a threat, I'm going to fight rather than, oh shit, that hurt, I need to reconsider my whole yeah. you know, view on everything. And I, I think that is difficult, but again, I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to value, I think, education in that is like, I think the bottom line is intellectually in, in a school, you get challenged by a professor. Mm-hmm. It doesn't always mean they're right and you're wrong, but you have to learn how to swallow that like you're wrong. Yeah. Uh, like you need to. Like you can't just stand up and say like, "All right, let's let's get into a fist fight <laughs> now," because I want to prove that I'm right and I'm going to knock you out by proof. Like, so when you're unconscious, then I, I I'm right. Um, and and I don't think. I, I don't think it resolves a lot of long term things for us. So, um, yeah, and I think, I think. Don't get me wrong. Like. I, I still have those things. Everybody who's human still has those defensive things where they want to be right and stuff. But I think you constantly get better uh, the more you subject yourself to the, scru- the scrutiny and the peer review. And it's it's why it's hard for me to stay out of, of school mm-hmm. because um, even as stuff started to get, I guess, get more traction with certain lifters becoming more successful and stuff with powerlifting, I, it made me, like it gave me anxiety because I almost felt like Oh man, like people are accepting things that I say, uh, so I, I need to check myself mm-hmm. in either with peers or reading, learning more, or or being, you know, or involving myself into peer groups that that will do that. Um, that's part of what drove me to to go back for the pharmaceutical chem stuff. Is like, okay, people really like the formulations, but am I actually right on this, yeah. or or do people just like it and they're making me believe I'm right? Mm-hmm. No, I think that's great. And I think that speaks a lot to your character. And it's actually segued really nicely into what was kind of my final question. Um, and that is to talk about De Novo um, and kind of talk about a little bit about its future, where you see it going. Um, I know we were talking about it off air, kind of, I think if people are following online, kind of the, the Instagram is now kind of growing quite rapidly and more information is coming out. I know you and Luke have recently done your YouTube series, which I've been following along, which was uh, fun to watch you try the formulations <laughs> yeah. and things so yeah just if you want to speak to a little bit about I guess actually for people who don't know De Novo kind of what your vision always was for it um, and then where you see it going in the future 
so I think the first part I'll start on, I think the fundamental vision of, I, I started as a consumer who was naive. And, and I, as I learned more, I became very frustrated and, and pissed off at companies who were blatantly lying or underdosing or, or just doing stuff that I think can be considered traditional business practices, but I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I think medicine to some degree needs to be preserved. And, and I think I'd categorize, I think supplements can appropriately be categorized into that. Um, like, uh, I think at the least you should aspire to, to be doing something better, uh, or improving things rather than just like always finding the way to make the buck. And I think as companies grow and they get a board of directors and people who have no, you know, uh, skin in the game with, with, uh, health outcomes, I think that becomes more and more of a challenge and you see that. Um, but anyway, uh, I think, I think value, a, a big question, uh, that it comes down to is value is like, are we contributing value at least as much as, as we're taking? So I always want products to be effective and it's always appreciated when people buy a product and say it does what I want it to. Like I, that's always the feedback I want, but mm -hmm. I think, I think there's this arm of it too, that I, I, as a young consumer, I looked at bodybuilding.com. It's like, oh, they're providing an educational outlet and resource too. Um, and I think I always said is like to myself, how can that be done in a way that maybe is a step better or refined than a bodybuilding.com who it, it's almost like, yes, it's education, but there's also some undertone of like, uh, of something else to it. Um, it's not really trying to give you the answer. It's trying to gear like it's trying to push you towards a product at the mm -hmm. end of it. Um, so, and I think we've gotten better at doing that. Like there's things that have no ties to, to product where we're just educating what we know is, is in demand for, uh, for the markets we're in. Uh, I think vision moving forward, um, is really just broaden outward. Like I think one of the, the, the most popular products we have is is utopia utopian and um the aspiration for that product was never just for fitness it was really aimed to be a coffee replacement um and no way uh yeah <laughs> so so basically uh can be used really for for anything um that people would routinely use use coffee for and and just give a better experience than, than just coffee itself so uh, I think one of the things is is esports is, is kind of growing, and we'd like to kind of get you know some some level involved in that, but also just getting better at everything we're doing. So like I, I think this just the general trend of progression and and theme of improvements, and when we've done that with products, I think we're doing it with content, um, especially educational content, um, and and again, finding finding ways that we can relate to just people. Uh, not necessarily just just fitness people, uh, and I think the the capstone that I'd, I'd want to say to that is is um, really thanking Luke for his his influence on it and uh, and objective outside input on everything uh, and really everybody that I, I think everybody past and present because as we touched on a little bit, um, De Novo has not just been a one year thing. It's it's been seven years now and. Um, it, it wouldn't be here without everybody who has put in time and passion and, and everything into it. So, uh, I think that can go unacknowledged and oftentimes when it's just one person talking, I think one person can get an excessive and probably too much. It's, it's like coaching too. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think the reality is, uh, nothing happens with just one person and, and all of those little sub influences all, create a larger tidal uh, wave of, of influence. So um, I never want that to be lost. So I guess whoever is listening and whoever may have been part in the past or, or future or now, it's it just I want to thank them. That's amazing. And I think the, the vision really speaks to what we've already spoken about so much in the podcast already, just what your character is like, um, looking for answers, looking to give value, um, not kind of being dogmatic and always trying to better so i think that's really powerful and that's why i really have always liked de novo and like yourself ben um and for people who don't know because we mentioned luke just so the listeners know that's luke johnson from shredded by science um who they're doing a great job over there as well and 
on part of your education, actually, that you've been doing recently, I've been listening to the podcasts. They've been excellent as well. So you've, the De Novo Nutrition podcast is kind of up and running, um, which has been fantastic. And obviously, you're on Instagram um, as well. And I, actually, out of interest, you talked about kind of going down the gamers market and using that product. Have you got any kind of new uh, flavors or new products at all in the works? Are you thinking about anything in future? Yeah, so we have a new product coming out that I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to breadcrumb a little bit. I'm not going to fully like disclose. Tease. Um, yeah, but all right, so hopefully it's out in about two months. Um, I think the general theme of the conversation has always been how can I take outside experiences and, and just information into creating a formula that I think does something unique and different and the user experience is, is very unique. And I think one of the problems I realized was um, there's this huge market for fat burners and everybody is, is trying to solve the problem by uh, increasing thermogenesis. But the, I think the problem in, in order to do that is to actually cause a large enough effect you'd have to kill somebody. You'd literally have to cook them to death, which is what the drug DNP yeah. kind of did and why people have, why it's fallen out of fashion. Um, so what is the thing that you actually can change with, uh, with weight regulation um, and actually provide a, a, a true body composition difference is you can change someone's subjective uh, level of, of appetite, how, mm -hmm. how hungry they are, how much satiety they get from a meal. So that will be our new product, um, and I never, I never wanted to do a fat burner, and I still don't call it a fat burner. Yeah. It, it will be an appetite suppressant, and um, I'm very excited because it's a unique spin on something that uh, it'll be our first encapsulated product. Um, it, it was built on the the same fundamental philosophy as as Utopia was in terms of like only use what's necessary, no no noise. Um, dose everything is in, in the clinical and actually human research uh, amounts that Amazing. that it's been used in, um, and it's it's nice. It's just yeah. So I, I'm, that's that's where I'm going to leave it, uh, and hopefully we could talk about it more once it comes out. No, I I'd love to. That's super exciting. I never really thought of. Everyone thinks about the energy balance equation, and they're always trying to tackle kind of burning more. Whereas why not ever think about the other end of the energy balance equation? So no, I love that because you've got all these kind of Fitbits and things trying to increase neat. But yeah, I think as bodybuilders and as a lot of people realize, like when you control what comes in, that's actually quite often more powerful. So no, I'm yep. glad that's coming out because that's going to help me in future comp preps and things. So that's going to be awesome. Um, I think that's everything I have for you this time, Ben. So I want to say a massive thank you for coming on. Um, I want to make sure everyone knows where they can reach out to you. So we've already talked about the DeNovo podcast, the Instagram, so they'll be linked. Um, as well as the website, but um, you've got your own Instagram page and Facebook. Where, if people want to kind of learn more about you, Ben, where should they reach you? Uh, I've I've kind of given less and less time to Facebook. Uh, so I am sort of on Instagram. I'd say I'm like as engaged as I'll probably be on social media on that platform. So that's probably the easiest one to to reach me on. Uh, they can also email me direct. Uh, it's Ben at DenovoNutrition.com. You can also reach me through the website. Um, it's just, you'll go through more of a chain if you, if you don't, uh, if you go through the site. Um, and those are probably the best two ones cause, um, like everybody else now, I'm kind of lost in my phone. So you'll yeah. get to me if you email me. <laughs> Amazing. So yeah, thank you again, Ben. And thank you everyone for listening. We will talk to you soon.